Yeah, today I'm uh, <laughs> come down with something. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, I got a doctor's appointment. <laughs> good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everybody. Welcome to this episode of the Nut Close Show. As always, Scott Clark, excited to be here today. And uh, excited to have a special guest from us uh, join us today from the DFW market. It's our buddy Logan Hensinger uh, from Sage Investments. Sage Notes? Sage Investments. Which, or is it Sage, Sage Notes? Notes. Sage, Sage Notes. Notes. Sage, Sage Notes. Investments was taken. <laughs> That's right. I remember. See, I helped do, we did the search <laughs> together on that. That's but, right. Uh, excited to have Logan on here. Logan's doing some amazing things, uh, taking down some deals, not just small one off sees either. He's doing some bigger notes and really can't cash in and he's uh ex we're excited to have him because he want a couple of things not only is he taking action and we'll be talking about some of the deals that he's done but he's working towards his goal of financial independence of being able to leave what he's doing now to focus full-time because you're doing this uh part-time right now right Logan? Yeah. part-time till about two in the morning you got your side hustle 7 p.m to 2 a.m right that's right so for those that don't know who you are, Logan, why don't you take a little bit and kind of talk of kind of about who you are and kind of your background getting into, into real estate and notes, okay? Yeah, so I, I started out um, with my bachelor's in finance, um, kind of pursuing the, uh, the investment space, um, going towards the wealth management, um, kind of transitioned to some private equity reporting, and currently sitting in a financial reporting role uh, for a, a large national firm uh, focusing on, on body collision work. So uh, you may or may not have heard of them, but uh, they're, they're pretty large. So that's kind of given me some exposure to some different areas, uh, allowing me some free time though as well. Um, back in 2015 is when I kind of read a book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad um, on my way of studying for, uh, to become a CFA or a chartered financial analyst, thinking the corporate path was, was what I was going for. Uh, that book was uh, eye-opening to say the least. And uh, I, I told myself I, if I had failed the, the test results, which were about a month out, then real estate was going to be what I was going to do. Uh, ever since then, we've, we've bought five or six rental properties, have sold all those off now, and have jumped into the, the note space full time as of as of last year, late, and um, you know trying to hit the ground running as, as fast as I can. So you got into the the, the landlord space first, I rentals, did. yeah, and then you did some fix and flips as well too. Yeah. Yeah, we sure did. And right here in the DFW area. Right. And over how long a time period did, were, was that? Were those... uh, so that was from 2015 to late 20 or to early 2019. So we sold the last uh, rental property here this early of the year. And you bought them pretty cheap. And, and, yeah, and we, made... yeah, that's what helped us uh, really kind of build some equity on the front end. We were finding distressed sellers for whatever reason, um, buying really cheap, fixing the property up, holding it for a couple of years. I really had, had intended on keeping it for lifetime cash flow. Um, but quickly, you know, learned that uh, some CapEx will eat away at that, along with uh, some tenant turns and uh, just decided that, you know, we had significant equity in the properties to, to go ahead and pull it out and, and see what else was out there that I could really scale. The rental business was, was difficult for me to envision scaling and, and really wanting to do full time. Uh, it just didn't, it wasn't that appealing after we were, you know, neck deep in it. <laughs> You're like, this is great, but I don't want to do this the rest of my life. Exactly. It, it paid paid us well. Um, there, I have no complaints about it. And, you know, I still push people that way as well. Just it, it's a good investment, um, but you've got to know what you're doing and you got to, you got to keep, you know, keep nailing it down or, or it's just going to fall apart in my opinion. That makes sense. Now, uh, what kind of, how'd you find out about the note space? Uh, so I was on a on another cash flow podcast that I would just on my way to work, and you were a guest speaker on that show, um, and was like, oh, okay, notes. I remember notes a couple of years back. Didn't really understand the inner workings of how they work, but I was like, mailbox money. I can I can sign up for that. I'm not getting mail, mailbox money today. So I jumped over to your podcast, and I probably listened to 40, 50 episodes in about 10 days. And uh, immediately signed up for uh, Fast Track and came down last uh, October or November. Okay. Yeah, you, I think you went through the virtual though too. Virtual with a blueprint. I then... thought about it, so I, I thought that that was a hands-on approach. I was like, nope. It, you, after you informed me, that's not hands-on. I was like, just tell me where the hands-on is, and I'll be there. <laughs> <laughs> well, but the thing is, you came in and then yeah. you immediately took action, though, right? Right. Yeah. It, you. You kind of showed me the the pieces of, of the marketing aspect that I didn't know really existed uh, or, or was needed um, in the note space, really in real estate in general. Um, I was just kind of a, you know, rental properties on the side and just kind of slowly but surely. Uh, but if you want to scale it and, and make it something that was full time, you really had to 
put a little bit more effort into it. And so you show me the, the marketing side of things and, and just what a note is, you know, how to price things and just the general scope from there and, and just take it and run with it. Yeah. And then you also did a really good job though. You, cause you had private investors that were funding some of your, your fix and flips, right? I, that and I, think, I think if I remember correctly, you talked to them and kind of told me, Hey, this, I'm going in a different direction. Do you guys want to be a part of this or not? Right. I did. So uh, about, a, about a week and a half, two weeks prior to heading down to fast track in November, I was kind of already prepping them saying, look, I'm, I'm in the process of selling the rentals. Um, I'm going to have some cash. Um, I know you guys are going to have some cash as well that, you know, I'm not going towards the, the traditional flicks and flip stuff. So if you guys are still looking to, to earn some cash, then uh, this is what I'm going to be doing. This is what I know so far. And I'll give you a call back on the way from Austin to DFW with, with the, with the rundown <laughs> and so far so good. So they were, uh, the reason I want to bring this up is because I think a lot of people, and we get a lot of fix and flippers. we got a, mm -hmm. a lot of landlords that are looking for better deals, better pricing on stuff. And they're just not seeing because the market's competitive right now. Let's just it face is. it. It is, especially in, in uh, the DFW market for sure. It's not mm -hmm. the only market out there, but that where you're at. Right. Uh, I, I think a lot of people are scared to have that conversation with their funding partners. Yeah. It's, it's a conversation that, you know, they're, they're kind of questioning you. Well, well, what was wrong with the rentals or what didn't work? And, and my, my piece was always, well, it's not that it didn't work. It's just, I'm looking for scalability. And I'm looking for things that uh, that will offer me a longer, um, uh, a, a, an approach that would get me where I wanted to be in the long run. Mm -hmm. And rentals did that to a certain degree, but not to the level that I, I knew I wanted to be in the near term, which was, you know, one to three years. So having that conversation, explaining them that, look, you know, I'm going down, I'm uh, learning as everything that I can and, and really just putting things to work. Is, is what kind of separated me from somebody else is like, yeah, I think about doing notes or I'm thinking about doing fix and flips. It's, I went out and did the fix and flips. I went out and did the rentals and I had made them money. So that helped. Um, and now I was buying notes and they were like, oh, okay. So he really is, he didn't just go down to, to you know, go to a conference and, and talk to some guy, so. And see some shiny object syndrome and go running back to them, you know? Exactly, yeah. Oh, look what I found. No, that's, that's not what we did. Yeah. So you came to the fast track, you put a plan together, and then you called him on the way back, said, okay, we're, we're both gun barrels blazing, right, going forward. Yeah, that's right, yeah. So what were some goals that you set yourself initially after going through the, the, the training and stuff like that? Because these are important things, mm -hmm. and I don't think they're as, as complicated as a lot of people will make them out to be, right? Exactly. I mean, the biggest piece for me was just kind of get, getting a presence um, on, on social media. When I came down to Fast Track, I hadn't had a Facebook in 10 years. Um, I had no social media accounts. Um, I Frankly, I just got tired of looking at other people's stuff. And, um, and then I realized you turned me on to forget that, forget what they think about you, forget about other people's stuff. It's, it's about you and how you grow your business. And so I left there with all my, all my um, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and all those things created. Um, got a website uh, designed and ready to roll without, within about a month after Fast Track. Um, and then the other piece was the marketing to the, uh, to the, to the asset managers and to my, my investor database, although small at that time, um, it just, you got to build it and start somewhere. Mm -hmm. So now, if I remember correctly at night after dinner during the fast track, you were actually going back to the hotel and the next morning you come in like Saturday morning. Okay. I did this. Can you check this out? Exactly. So I did this last night. Can you check it out? Right. Right. And, and for me, you know, I've, I set sometimes too lofty of goals, but I've got to do that for, for myself just so that I can can uh, do everything I can. And even I'm probably not going to hit that goal um, in, in you know, the back of my head, but um, you know, it just helps me get going. Mm -hmm. So we had, but, we had a goal of a hundred deals this year. Uh, we're probably not going to hit that. <laughs> we're at 10 today. So uh, I've got a long way to go, but without that, you know, if I said, just do one, I did one in February. Okay. Now what, you know, so I, I've got to keep the pedal down. So, let, let's talk about some of those deals. You, or let's do this instead. Are you doing this? Do you have kids? Are you married? You know, well, how many hours you put into your job? Let's let's set up what your normal week hour wise looks like for it for those that are listeners out there. Yeah, so it's a it's a nine to five typical corporate job. Um, it's about a thirty minute drive there and back. So I've got an hour's worth of commute in between there. Um, I'm home around six. I've got two girls that I come home to five and three, and uh, they. You know, they take my time up, but I want them to take my time up. I get home and I put my bag down, I 
you know, I eat dinner and then we either go to swim in the pool and just hang out and relax and, and be with them. Um, then they go to bed around nine and I'm at the gym and then I'm back home working from usually 10 30 to 11 to about two in the morning. Mm-hmm. So that's typically three to four days a week. And then some stuff on this on the weekends. So what are your, your 10 to two activities that you're doing from 10 PM to 2 PM? On um, it, it's kind of shifted. Um, in, in the very beginning, it was really honing in on, on finding asset managers and finding uh, leads. Um, I was scrubbing a lot of the county record stuff for looking for um, assignment of mortgages and things like that, that you had talked about in a podcast. Mm-hmm. And that led to a deal. Um, Hang on I, a second. Hang on. There's a nugget for people there. <laughs> you, you, you did what? You picked one, which county did you pick? Uh, so in this case, I was looking in North Carolina and that was, if I'm pronouncing it right, Bacombe or Bacombe County. Yeah. Bacombe County in Asheville, North Carolina. Well, yep. So I, I like the market and I uh, just kind of dove into that, that area and, and was looking for common um, uh, grantee grantors on the, on the assignment of mortgages. So when you pulled your search, how big over a search did you do? A year, a month, six months? Uh, so I did it back to 12 months from whenever that date was, maybe maybe late February, early March. Yeah. Okay. So it, 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 did it pull a big list for you? As a, as roughly, I want to say 3,000 records. Okay. And how did you whittle it down? Did you narrow uh, so it down? I'm, yeah. So I'm very, obviously very uh, crafty with Excel being my, my corporate job's got all that uh, in there. So um, something called the pivot table was able to slice the information the way I needed it to um, and do some counts and say, okay, well, who's got more than 10 in the last year? Okay. These are the people I want to focus on. Oh, Wells Fargo out, JP Morgan out <laughs> and ran into a, to a group called Penny Mac, uh, which I'd heard of, um, but didn't know how big they were. They're massive. Um, but I was, I didn't, time I didn't know. So I went ahead and reached out on LinkedIn. That was the next uh, kind of follow up of, okay, who are some individuals that work at this, this company? Uh, with some keywords, asset manager, special assets, distressed, um, anything I could think of. And came across a couple of individuals um, that led to an email that got shuffled around within the company. And then finally to the, you know, the lead decision maker on, on selling, you know, single one-off uh, non-performing loans. So how many times, how over time period before you reached out initially mm-hmm. to the time that you actually got a list? How, what time frame was that? Um, probably three weeks. Okay. How many contacts did you have to make? Did you have to follow up more than once or five? Yeah. So with that person, um, there was no follow up. They reached out to me pretty quickly uh, within the first uh, week or so that I'd say I'd submitted that LinkedIn request. And um, then they shuffled me around, like I said, and then finally talking with the person, you know, they vetted me. They wanted to know that I had a, uh, a servicer in place, you know, who I was, and, you know, all the background about what we were doing. And make sure that I could I could legit close uh, if we got to that point. Um, so that was about a three week process. So if you obviously if you contact them on LinkedIn, they probably checked out your LinkedIn profile, right? Correct. Yeah. You had a, a relatively brand new LinkedIn profile, though, right? Uh, LinkedIn I'd had for a while, so okay. that was one of the things that I had picked up from college. Uh, so that was probably eight or nine years old at the time. But that was my only what I called social media, uh, but I wasn't active on it. I mean, there was really nothing other than just some, some prior job history. And so then, you updated that though with what, your new stuff, yeah. some of your past fix and flips or things like that or no? Yeah, so as soon as I you know left Fast Track, that's when I started pushing stuff out there that I, we had closed on some things. Um, I'm in the note space now. This is what I'm looking for. This is how we help help borrowers in the end. Cool. Well, I'm, I'm only bringing it up because a lot of people don't do the things we say to do. and. <laughs> Kind of work, don't they? They they do. Uh, that that deal's uh, gonna gonna make us some pretty good money here in the next month. So let's talk about that Asheville deal. Oh, first of all, they sent you a, they sent you a list. Yep. They sent you a one off asset. Uh, we got a list of about 110, 100 assets. Um, a lot of stuff sitting in New York. Not interested. Um, and a lot of this paper was was bought from uh, from JP Morgan back in 2010, 11, and 12. And it was just, you know, bottom of the barrel stuff for them that they were just trying to move. Um, at the end of the day, they had a floor for what they were trying to sell it for. And I said, just give me your floors and I'll see if it works. And uh, we, we were able to find that asset. And, you know, I was like, okay, there's enough equity in the deal. Uh, we're, we're this far through the foreclosure process. The borrower had made a payment in 10 years. Um, in, in 10 years, huh? 10 years, yeah. He, he, it was a part of a condo development and the condo went under in 2006. Now they finished the completion of, of uh, 
of the condos and, you know, people were coming in and buying them. He just happened to buy one and, you know, the whole thing kind of went under. Uh, still operational today, but, you know, he didn't make it out so well. So let's talk about the numbers on this. So <laughs> what's, what was the value of the condo when he first kind of came across it? Uh, so we were, we were somewhere between 245 and 255. Okay. And uh, what was the unpaid balance on the loan? Uh, 254. Again, he'd probably made about six payments on the loan. And with all the arrears and interest and penalties, he was pushing 450. Woo! So pay off 450. <laughs> yeah. Value 250. Hadn't made a payment in 10 years. Did you deal with any, uh, and had the bank, anybody started foreclosure process yet or not? Yeah, they were almost done with the foreclosure. Uh, they were just tired of messing with it. Um, it was getting stuck in the appeals process. Uh, the borrower was kind was trying to fight the fact that there was they were owed money on a title policy. There was some indication of forged signatures they lost, um, and then the settlement was was finished up in the appeals process, which cleared the way for the foreclosure, which had already been awarded, um, but the appeal was holding it up. So, probably five days after we took it and, and bought the note, we we were awarded and we moved on. So it it was luck, it was action, it was a number of things, but. It worked out. So do you mind sharing roughly? Are you done? Is the bar out of the deal? Yeah, the bar is out. Yeah, we okay. own it as an REO. Okay. What did you end up buying the note for? At 173. Hang on a second. What? 173. What kind of percentage is that off of the 250 value? Um, let's see. Real quick. We're saying 173. We're looking at Roughly six, 70 cents on the dollar is what you paid for the note. Yeah, about 70 cents. But you knew Mainly it was going to be of equity. Yeah, it had a significant amount of equity. Yeah, 70, right. 70, you know, 75 grand there. Now, yeah. did this go smooth? Did you just walk in, turn around and sell it? Or did the, the borrower get kind of do some shady stuff to it? Uh, the borrower did do some shady stuff to it. Um, these are fully furnished um, units. So what there's a rental program that each unit, unit can be placed into um, as a vacation rental for when the, when the owner is not there. Uh, so we, we had all accounts that this thing was fully furnished and it was um, until about three days after the foreclosure sale and they ripped out everything. Uh, they took um, furniture, tabletops, dishes, silverware, oven, uh, stackable washer and dryer, uh, just about everything you can take except for the countertops and lights <laughs> and cabinets. So, which is fine. Um, you know, we still had money in it. Uh, all fully fixed up. You're probably looking at 285 to 290. Um, I got a list of kind of what, what it would take to get it back into the rental program from the property manager, which is about 17,000. It wasn't worth us putting the additional money in to, to make another 10 with that risk. So we, it's right now it's listed for 265 on the market. Um, we're getting some help. We've got a property right next door to us or a unit listed at 310. Um, so we're a deal. <laughs> and uh, that's been on the market for about seven, eight days now. Yeah, you know, there's some pretty good interest. Um, it's a, you know, a different property. So it's going to be a different type of borrower, sure. or buyer, but, um, you know, we're, we've got full confidence that even if we drop the price five, 10 grand, um, we'll move it, and we'll be fine. And so from the time that you bought the note to how many, how far along are we some from the time you bought the note right now? Uh, we bought the note uh, March 15th, March 30th, somewhere in there. Um, we'll probably be out of it. Um, I'm expecting by August 31st. So that's not too bad. So five months in and out and what, 50 grand at least in profits? Uh, at least. Yeah, at least. And are your funny partners on this? Are they a, a flat percentage or? A, flat percentage. Oh, oh, nice. Yeah. <laughs> nice. Now you've had some good success too with talking with funny partners about getting stuff at a pretty uh, in, uh, cheap interest rate too, haven't you? Yeah, well, I wouldn't say cheap. Uh, it, it's 10%. Um, okay. So that's what we're, we're kind of offering people. Um, a lot of my connections are, are, I wouldn't say savvy investor, you know, re with real estate, but they're familiar with the returns that are generated from real estate. So with that background, you know, you know I'm not going to be able to offer the, the four, six, 8% uh, returns. And, you know, as long as the deal makes sense, then I can afford to pay the 10. Um, because the way I see it at the end, it's, um, a part of a deal is better than no deal. Mm. So we'll, we'll take what we can get for now. Yeah. So that's not so bad. So if they're, if you're in it, uh, what, what are you, what's, what's your, you know, what say 175 and you're getting, having to pay them 10%. Yeah. So you pay them basically eight grand in interest costs along the time. Right. And you make 70 grand roughly. Something like that. That's not too shabby. <laughs> it's not too bad. Yeah. I'll take every $50,000 I can get. Right. <laughs> right. 
Yeah. Is the wife and kids pretty excited about that? Uh, yeah. So she, you know, when I first got into it, uh, she was kind of wishy-washy on me moving around with, from the rental stuff because that was tangible. That was, it was easy to see. We could drive by it. Um, with the note piece, you know, I'd given her one of your books. She had read it and, you know, it made sense. Um, but, you know, she's a big uh, all talk and no action. So she wanted to see some action. So, um, you know, at the end of the day, we, we own a, a condo. I was like, why don't you fly out to Asheville and go stay there for a night? There's no bed, but you can hang out there. You so can go it's, see it and go stay next door, right? That's right. That's right. So yeah, she's um, she's pretty excited about the, about that property moving, and she's kind of already carved out a thousand dollars so she can go to the mall or something. You better have a good shut up check for that lady. <laughs> that's right. No, it, it's already there. It's already carved out of the uh, closing statement. That's good stuff. Now, uh, do you mind sharing kind of what your financial goals? Because you've got a goal of what you need coming in basically monthly to help you if you want to leave your current full time gig, right? Right. Yeah. So I'm, I'm completely honest with basically anybody that I talk to in terms of my numbers. Um, ideally we're probably, I'm, I'm like to push in six to 7,000 a month um, with our latest note that we picked up out in California. Uh, that was a sizable property with a sizable note balance. And uh, the payment on that one was pushing $3,400 a month. So obviously that got me pretty close um, on top of the, the non-performing stuff that I've gotten performing since. So with the numbers right now, we're probably about 75, 80% of the way through of my cash flow goal um, of some recurring stuff. And then obviously you get the windfalls like the 70 when we pick that up. Um, but I'm, I'm really basing it off of, you know, just performing stuff that we can, we can really count on. Right. Let's talk about that California deal because you called me about it. I was like, oh my gosh, I think you got too many ducks, too much stuff in the barrel. And I will be the first one to say that I'm eating a little crow here because it's turned out to be a phenomenal deal. I was like, I don't know. You know, um, yeah, I was Joel, just Joel wanted all that one. Huh? Joel, he, he helped us review the collateral on that one. And uh, he was like, man, if this bank sells you anymore, let me know because I want it. <laughs> there you go. So let's talk about that. Let's not give away your source name. No, right? no. So you bought, is this from a hedge fund or another bank or oh, this what? Is a, this is Bank Direct. Yeah. It's a Bank Direct deal. And how yeah. did you get a hold of this people? Through LinkedIn, email, phone calls, what? Um, that was, another, again, actually that was part of my, my asset manager email list. So that was, um, I think somebody that was came through your list uh, because I know I didn't source it. Um, so it was just constant contact. Um, I, I think what it helped is I was finding some good subject lines yeah. that were catching people's eyes. And um, again, my email got shuffled around within the bank and finally ended up at a VP of treasury. And uh, he's like, hey, I've got a scratch and dent uh, or whatever you want to call a scratch and dent. Let's just talk about the loan. And then you let me know where, where you are. Uh, so that one was a in Roseville, California, or kind of, I guess it's closer to the mountains. So yep. um, it's out there more of a, a rule. It was a, kind of an ag loan. Um, they had taken out a construction loan back in 2007 uh, to build a, a build a property on five acres. Uh, they're in the business of growing strawberries, avocados, all types of stuff. Um, so it's a, it's a big market for, you know, anybody that lives in that area. Uh, I didn't know. So that was where we brought in Joel to help review the, the collateral, but also the asset. Um, and then utilizing uh, Dickie Baldwin for inspections and um, getting O&E reports and everything on there. Everything came back clean, exactly what we were looking for. Um, that bar had defaulted um, back in 2008, 2009 on the construction loan. And they were able to, actually they filed bankruptcy and about half the loan was written off. So about $900,000 of the loan was written down to about 450. Um, and then over the last seven years, they've been paying uh, consistent payments. So I got a full seven year payment history. Um, and they've actually been paying an additional 150 to $200 in additional principal every month um, on a regular basis. So with that, uh, coupled with how much equity was in the property, the property we're at today is worth about 1.2 million. Um, beautiful home, five bedroom, three bath, like 3,100 square feet. And um, yeah, it's, it's just, it was a good pickup. We were able to get that one. We paid 222 on a UPB of 284. So, Hang on a second. You pay basically 70 cents in the dollar for a loan at what type of LTV though? So it's worth uh, I don't, What is that? So it's worth how much again? 1.2? 1.2. And it, the under, underlying balance on the loan is 280? 284. 1.2 million. So you pay basically 24% LTV that you paid 70 cents on the dollar for. That's right. Okay. 
that doesn't suck. Those are good percentages because you still got what 70 grand if you have to foreclose and all this equity. That's right. Behind you that honestly they could go take a private hard money loan out and, and wipe me out. That's fine. Yeah, in a good way. Yeah. Right. It, yeah, the borrower in this in this position has every incentive to keep making payments or find a way to refi us out, which I'm okay with. So <laughs> what's the underlying interest rate on in the loan? Uh eight or nine percent. Okay. So at a twenty at a thirty percent discount, you're seeing somewhere between eleven and twelve percent cash and cash return on your your cash flow. Uh, no, this one's pushing eighteen. Oh, that's right. That's right. Okay, seventeen point six. Now that I remember correctly, <laughs> you got it. That's right, seventeen point six. And then your investor on this one, their your money partners are relatively cheap on this one. Uh, so this one we decided um, since we didn't have the funds available. Um, what I did on this one is is a short term loan. We're doing basically a five month structured loan on this of uh, just a, a 10% and then we'll, we'll pay them out after we close the, uh, the Asheville deal and, and cash them out. And then we'll, we'll hold this one as a, as a portfolio loan for us. Um, you know, I'm tying up some money, but you know, again, my our strategy is really partial cash flow, partial, you know, profits on the back end. So we're trying to find that, that happy medium. Yeah. 17.6% yield on your own funds is not bad. No. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, right now I was making about two and a half at my Wells Fargo savings account. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh, good stuff. Now, those are two deals. What have been the other eight? Has been a mixture of CFDs, non-performers? What's been up with the other ones that you've bought? Yeah, so we started out in February with uh, two non-performing CFDs. Um, had good indication on both of those loans that the borrowers were still there. Uh, the properties were in, were in good shape and, uh, you know, they weren't letting things fall apart. Uh, we're able to get those reperforming with uh, some forbearance agreements, utilizing our, our friends out at Polaris. Um, so, you know, love those guys. They've, they've really helped us, you know, um, kind of accelerate the uh, the back on plan uh, approach for our non-performing stuff. Uh, those are now switched to performing at, at Madison and, you know, we're collecting payments every, every month on those. Uh, we paid, let's see, I got it here, about 40 cents on the dollar for those. Uh, for those CFDs with uh, values at 65 and UPBs sitting around 45 to 50,000. Cool. Um, and then we picked up three other CFD performing loans out in Georgia. Um, so we paid in total about 83,000 for those with a UPB of, let's see, about 120,000. Um, so we got a pretty good yield on those as well. You know, on, on average about 75 cents on the dollar for those. And uh, again, still just monthly payments being collected there. Um, so, you know, it, like I said, it, it's been a blend of, you know, I started out solely focused on non-performing stuff and then realizing, okay, if I'm going to do this full time, you know, I need some consistent income that I can count on. How am I going to get there? I'll, I'll, I'll throw in some performing stuff along the way. Um, and, you know, we're still buying non-performing stuff today as well. That's good stuff. And has the raising capital gotten easier for you? Has your guys that you've dealt with before still working with them or you work with new people now? Um, so working with new people, those, those guys are getting a little tapped. Um, uh, I was able to essentially raise 750,000 over the weekend, uh, for a loan deal that we've got. Hang on a second. Hang on a second, everybody. 750 grand over a weekend. Uh, it, was a, it was a quick phone call with, with a good close friend of mine that I had invested in some apartment syndications. And, you know, we've been, we've been talking actually a bear pockets, uh, guy that I had known for four or five years now. So that was a, that's a pool, same seller from this last Roseville, California note. Uh, he called me Friday night at the grocery store. I'm walking through, picking out some steaks. And uh, he's like, hey, I got an off the wall question. Do you buy small performing loans? I said, sure. It's not off the wall, but um, we'll, we'll take a look at it. He said, all right, well, uh, I've got about 750,000 UPB on this, um, you know, all in the Roseville area that you're, you're somewhat familiar with now. And uh, we kind of passed it around to Raymond James, which is a, a fairly large wealth management firm, a little too small for their, for their liking. And uh, so we'll, we should be getting that tape any minute and we'll, we'll look to try to take that one down as well. That's awesome. So I just follow up and complete a deal. An asset manager called you up and said, Hey, thanks for funding this deal. We got another one for you. Huh? It, exactly. Yeah. And before we'd even closed the first one, I was already hitting them up with, Hey, I know we haven't closed yet. I know you haven't got the funds, but um, do you have anything else? So the question is, what did you send the guy? 
Do you send them? I would be sending that guy a good bottle of scotch or, yeah, he, or a, a box of cigars, man. Exactly. Yeah, we, we've got a few things that we like to send based on uh, gender and um, based on their their role at the bank. So whether it's edible arrangements or uh, some chocolates or some some whiskey or something, we'll we'll sneak that through the mailbox and and get it out. That's phenomenal, man. That's good stuff. Now, your goals, you set the goal of wanting to do close on 100 deals your first year. Obviously, things have changed a little bit. And you're yep. still doing this on truly, what, 10 hours a week, 10, 15 hours a week? Yep. Doing anything on the weekends or just strictly like late at night, Monday through Thursday nights? for the Weekends, month? I try to take it easy. Um, unless there's something that comes in, I'll, I'll take a look at the tape and, you know, high level, pick out some things that we want to do for Monday. But I try to try to scale back on the weekends. I was hitting it hard for the first three or four months every weekend. I mean, every day uh, I was just uh, trying to figure out everything I could and trying to move forward at this point. I'm trying to get a feel for what it's going to be like on a full-time basis and trying to plan out my schedule and, you know, wake up, I'm going to do these things and uh, you know, just schedule it out. Mm -hmm. Now, one of the biggest things you're probably stocking reserves away still to you. you I know you're a frugal guy anyway, mm -hmm. saving, saving money, having expenses, obviously two girls and your wife. That's always a, a concern, right? We talk about they, that. They like to go out and, and buy a few things. And they, oh, okay. I didn't say it. You said that. You hung your soul <laughs> there, brother. Okay. I'm, not, I'm just speaking the truth. Yep. Yep. Nothing wrong with that. Hey, mama needs a new pair of dancing shoes. Nothing wrong with that at all. Okay? all right. So let's, let's talk about those goals. What are you, I mean, well, the one thing that comes to my mind is, hey, I would make sure that you're hitting your financial goals for reserves and reperforming stuff. Mm -hmm. without that big one added into it. Exactly. That's, that's exactly how I'm approaching it. Uh, the windfalls are, are kind of exclusive of my, of my calculation for cash flow. And, uh, you know, when they hit, great. That'll, that'll allow us some, some additional capital if we want to add a performing loan or just kind of stock away and, uh, you know, use for a rainy day, rainy, rainy day fund. So That's good stuff there. Now, mm -hmm. what, how, many goals do you how many deals do you think you'll, you'll hit before the year is out? Well, if we can wrap up the 17, that'll, that'll more than double us. I'd like to be at 50. Um, we'll see how it goes, but uh, I've got some outstanding bids on some other properties. Um, we've got another bank that we're looking at a, a commercial type of loan where an individual wrapped into four rental properties within the loan. And, you know, he's defaulted, with, I think about 350 days plus. So uh, still waiting to hear back on that, on that bid. And uh, so that'll push us to, to a few extra. So ideally we're around 50. The 17 is the 750 coming from Raymond James that we were talking about a second ago? Because I missed yeah. the set where the 17, okay. No, yeah, the 17 is coming from, uh, well, not from Raymond. Raymond was a potential buyer, but yeah, yeah, it's the, my the, undisclosed seller. Yeah, that's right. Because you ain't giving, don't be sharing that with nobody, brother. No. No, don't be sharing that at all. But that's that's a beautiful thing of you're taking action, you're doing, putting the work in it. And, and one of the things I want to push to everybody is, your, hey, you had 90 days roughly where you were hitting it pretty heavily, putting your marketing and systems in place. Mm -hmm. Now, what are some of the things you're doing consistently now each week to, out to help market and raise capital? Yeah, on, on a weekly basis, it's really either publishing, you know, some, some not original content, just kind of taking some, some articles that we find interesting out there and putting our spin on it and then throwing that out to our social media profiles. Um, and then also keeping up with our, with our marketing to our um, asset managers. That's what is, what, what's, what's, what, what's incorporated with that? What are you doing out to your asset managers? Is it, is it an email blast once a month, once a week? What's it? How, it's what's an email how? blast on typically Tuesdays and Thursdays, sometimes Wednesdays. We'll, we'll mix it up a little bit. Um, but at most, we're doing it two times, you know, to, to a fresh uh, list. And then we'll follow up with anybody that didn't open. So I try not to, to send too many emails to them. Uh, but we are, you know, fairly on their radar, hopefully. Do you know what kind of open rates you're getting on your asset manager emails? Yeah, it started out pushing like five, six percent. And right now it's hovering around one and a half to two. On open rates? On open rates. Okay. Wow. That's really low. Yeah, it is. It is low. That's, that's, that's what, surprisingly low. Yeah, it, it's dropped over the last couple of months. Um, we're getting a lot of uh, out of office uh, you know, whether it's holiday, vacation, or we no longer work here, um, go go contact the other person. So what I've been trying to do is kind of scrub all those emails where they're giving me additional uh, contact information and then putting those in my database. And, and but that's, you know, it just takes time. So we're trying to always increase it as, as people unsubscribe. But you're still getting people that are reaching back out to you. It takes one person to send you a list and just follow exactly. up. Exactly. 
Yeah, I mean, just uh, about a month ago, we thought we had a pretty good opportunity with a with a realtor uh, broker uh, of, of notes to um, try to help a borrower out that was looking through a short going through a short sale, and you know, trying to go through your strategy that you had talked about at our last mastermind, where you know we go through and we talk contact the, the loan sale department of the of the bank that's going through the short sale and see if you can't work through. This happened to be a, a Ginnie Mae loan, so weren't able to do anything with that, but. Uh, again, somebody called us up because of uh, an interesting subject line that I had and was, was curious about our process, you know, how that can work. And then they were like, okay, well, if I ever see something like this again, I'm calling you. That's a good thing. Now, what kind of, you're sending, are you sending a weekly email out to your regular investor contact database? It, it's picked up lately. Um, I was, you know, I kind of fell off that, that piece uh, over the last couple of months. I was doing maybe one a month. Right now I've done just because we've had some action going on, you know, they're getting one every Sunday. Um, but that one's probably got us uh, close to a 60% open rate. Um, and then we'll follow up with anybody that didn't open from there. Cool. Have you reached out to the asset managers that have sent you stuff? If they have any other friends or uh, peers at different banks yet? We've tried that. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of, and it's fallen dead. Um, they've either unresponsive or they'll, they'll say, we'll get back to you a little busy right now. So, uh, we've, it's a, it's a strategy that we've tried to use. Um, it's just kind of, it's fallen on deaf ears for the, for the few that we have reached out to. Mm -hmm. What would you say? Um, so would you say the fast track was worth coming to? <laughs> yes. <laughs> With, without the fast track, I'd probably be one note in at this point. Um, you know, my whole goal with going down to fast track was I wanted to be up and running the, the Sunday night I was leaving. And, you know, I, I tell everybody that, that, is asking, you know, how'd you get going so quick? I was like, well, there's, there's a guy named Scott Carson and in a fast track program that I attended and, you know, he gave me all the tools that I need is now it's just about me going out and doing it. Uh, how much local networking are you doing at different meetups and real estate clubs that are in the DFW area? Unfortunately, I don't go to a single meetup. Um, I found in the past that there's a lot of salesy meetups in the DFW area. Uh, maybe there's some good small niche ones. Um, but for right now, I just, I haven't really focused on it because a lot of those investors, again, are also, uh, either being poached <laughs> at that same meeting or, uh, savvy enough to, to want some returns that are, you know, that we're not offering. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. What are you doing to attract new investors? Uh, so the attracting the new investors, I've, I've tried to post, you know, articles about just experiences that we've had with rentals. Um, obviously rentals are a, are a, a top topic, uh, on any kind of type of real estate forum. And so what we'll kind of do is, you know, so some, share some pictures about some rentals that have been trashed or, uh, you know, say, hey, you want to be a landlord? Uh, so that was my biggest uh, attraction right there. I probably got close to four or five thousand, you know, shares or views uh, through that post and, you know, got scheduled phone calls with investors. And um, so it's, it's hit or miss with with each post that we put out there. But at the end of the day, it's, you know, it's being consistent with it. And, you know, I had a scheduled phone call earlier today, um, just have, had to push back for, uh, for a few other things going on at work, but um, I'm probably getting a phone call once a week where we're talking to a potential investor or somebody who wants to learn a little bit more about notes and maybe partner and go from there. Cool stuff. Now, what, are you posting that strictly to Facebook or Bigger Pockets or other places? Uh, so I've been removed from the Bigger Pockets Facebook group. Uh, they didn't oh, like Facebook my Facebook group, okay. Yeah, from the Facebook group, they didn't like my content there. Um, I was being honest, but they didn't like it. But everywhere else, there's uh, a couple of note buyers uh, groups out on Facebook. Um, I post on Instagram. I post on uh, my LinkedIn page, both business and professional and my personal. Are you posting to the Bigger Pockets Bigger Pockets page? Is what I'm trying to get. I, yeah, I do. So I, I'll go to the marketplace there. I'm a pro member, and and I'll post some, some upcoming deals that we have, um, and then just some general things that we're doing within Bigger Pockets. I try to stay active in terms of people looking for advice. Uh, you know, hey, we just saw something about notes that seems really interesting. I'll share kind of my thoughts about what I think notes are and uh, really just be genuine. And whether it's right or wrong or indifferent advice, uh, it, it's, you know, it shows that I have some knowledge of, of what notes are. And you got a little bit, dude. You pulled out 17 deals, man. That's nothing, <laughs> or 10, and you got another 17. Yeah, I well, that's possible 17. Nothing yeah, to be disappointed about, man. No, not at all. I mean, I'm very happy with where we've been and where we've gotten so far. And, um, you know, I really look forward to, to what's coming up down the pipeline. What would you say has been the biggest aha moment that maybe you thought would be a little bit more difficult on the front end that turned out to be a lot easier than what you expected? Putting myself out there. Um, I've 
I'm not necessarily a, a, a private person, but you know, I, I viewed social media as a, you know, as a platform for everybody to post all the great things that they're doing and that's all you ever see. And so I was like, I just don't want to be that person that's always doing that. And looking at it from a business perspective and just saying, you know what, it doesn't matter what some think because not everyone thinks the same way. So that's why there's, there's, there's a lot of us out there. So it was really kind of getting over that hurdle of just put yourself out there and then see what happens. And, you know, here we are today. Yeah. You've, you've done, have you had any pushback from friends, family, anything like that? What, what's no pushback. What's funny is they all think I'm full time. Oh, really? Yeah. So they all think based on my activity on social media, like, man, you must be doing amazing. And it's like, well, I'm doing good. I wouldn't say I'm doing amazing. Amazing for me is, is doing this full time. But, uh, you know, they're always shocked to hear that I'm just doing this on the weekends and, and nights. What are some tools that you're using to help to share that out there to, uh, on different things? Uh, my, my biggest um, app is uh, Zoho Social. Uh, it's a free application. I'm not able to schedule anything. That's a, that's a piece that you can upgrade to. I probably will. Um, but for right now, I just kind of create a bunch of drafts and I get them prepared and, um, and then post them out to, it allows me to hit every piece of my social media that, that I need to on one publish button. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Now, um, you're working 40 plus hours a week at the job. Yeah. That's right. And then you've got a little bit of flexibility there if you need to answer a phone call or an email or schedule. Yeah, something. we do. Yeah, I'm able to step away or, you know, we're not too strict on, you know, time clocks and things like that with, with the corporate job. So, um, you know, if a call comes in, you know, I can usually either take it in another room, you know, 10, 10 minutes later, or, or maybe I can take it right there. So it's, it's pretty flexible in that regard. What do you think? When, when, when do you think the time frame is that you'll be putting your notice in? Well, hopefully they don't see this, but um, ideally it's somewhere around March. So let's just not share it to your Facebook page, okay? Yeah. <laughs> That's right. It, it, it'll only go to a select few, but, um, you know, I've, I've thought about maybe doing December, uh, but what I really want to do is kind of just max out my 401k for the rest of the year, uh, max it out again, contributing every, every dollar I can for my paycheck uh, for the rest of that, max out the 401k, walk away with a sizable um, you know, retirement plan that I can, you know, invest on the side as well with, with notes and, uh, you know, take every tax advantage that I can with, with the 401k piece and then file accounts on, based on our track record so far, I don't, I don't see any reason why we won't be hitting that goal. Are you using, you know, are you uh, contributing to your own, uh, self-directed IRAs? Um, I do. I, I max those out 5,500 bucks or whatever the, the, rec the amount is right now. Um, and then I max out, like I said, the, the retirement plan at work. Um, and do everything we can to, to sock away the, the tax-free dollars. That's awesome, man. I'm so excited to see the success you're having. Proud of you. I mean, you're just, you're out rocking and killing it and, and closing from other sources that aren't the, the low hanging fruit that everybody else is chasing for the most part. Right. right. Yeah. And, you know, we still use uh, David Polio and, and John Keith and, you know, those guys have some stuff that'll pop through and that makes sense. And, you know, I'll throw a bit on there and we'll get accepted. Um, but, you're right. I mean, we, we've got to stay focused on finding leads out there that, you know, maybe others know about, but it's, it's not, you know, low hanging fruit, like you said. That makes sense there. Um, what's the bit of advice that you would give to somebody out there who's looking to, to, to get into notes from the fix and flip or the round space? What's some good advice you'd give somebody? At the end of the day, for me, it's really, you know, if, you, if you're already doing real estate, then obviously you're taking some action at that point, but it's still, to me, it comes down to taking action. Um, I, I feel like a lot of us are all kind of stuck with the education and we want to learn and learn and learn and we still never feel like we're there yet and you're, and you're not going to. There's not enough in a book. There's not enough that you're going to tell somebody or I'm going to tell somebody that's going to get them over the hurdle or over the fear and uh, you kind of just go. Uh, people always ask me like, man, aren't you afraid of like spending that much money or, or buying this or buying that? I was like, I'd be afraid if I didn't. Um, so that it's just a different mindset. And that's, I think that's what it comes down to is, and it took me a while. I mean, I was a big spender in college. I, I left college with like $8,000 in credit card debt. Um, my wife wouldn't let us join bank accounts until I paid off all my stuff. So uh, <laughs> she, she turned me into the, to the frugal person that I, that I think I am today. Um, but really kind of, you know, with the book and her and, you know, changing my mindset about what money can do for you. Um, it's, that's what's helped. Uh, besides Rich Dad, Poor Dad, do you have a favorite book out there that you, you, um, back I, the book you shared with us, win, win revolution. Um, I try to share that one as much as possible. It's, it's a good book about how, you know, non-performing notes can be turned into performing notes. 
and you can help a borrower out. You know, worst case, you got to take the property back. Um, but there's, you know, I like the richest, richest man in Babylon, I think. Um, just, some, you know, it's a frugal book. They talk about saving and investing and making your money work for you. Um, there's a profit first book that I like. I can't yeah, remember that one. Yeah. Yeah. Mike, that's a good book. Uh, so I can't pronounce Mike's here. last name, but I mean, either. <laughs> I got it right. Here. Or, or, Mc, Mc, yeah, Mc, Mc, yes, like that. <laughs> so yeah, I've, you know, I've read a, a number of books. Um, trying to think another one that I always listen to on uh, audio books. So a good one is, uh, uh, what is it? The wealthy millionaire next door or something. Millionaire next door, baby. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. That's, that's a classic. So again, you know, nothing new here with, with the books that have kind of inspired me and gotten to where I am. So, you know, there's something to be said about, about those books that, you know, those taking action just works. That's the big thing. It's all about getting off the hump and putting things into place. The things that we necessarily talk about the fast track or the things like that aren't really complicated things. It's more mm -hmm. of just, Hey, get out there and do these things and, and rinse and repeat. And eventually you'll, you'll, it's like planting seeds. You plant them and you go back in water and fertilize water and fertilize, give them sun and they eventually bear fruit. Correct. You got it. Yeah, that, that's it. Um, you know, so many of us, like I said, just get bogged down in, in the details and, and just the fear of, of taking action for losing something. Uh, so it's just, it's just a mindset. Yeah. Well, Logan, I'll tell you what, buddy, you're doing an amazing job. Um, <laughs> just absolutely tickled pink and I, what kind of success you're having, man. You mean, um, you're just, you're doing an amazing job and you're also being there to help answer questions for people out there, which is commendable as well too, for anybody. Yeah. Out there, so, yeah. Um, and I can't thank you enough. I mean, every time I get a response from my asset manager email, I want to call you up and say, Hey, thanks. And then hang up. I mean, you just, said a few texts. I'm always fine for that. She yeah. got another one and another one. Yeah, it's just, just, gonna just, going, yeah, just keep reaffirming the fact that it works. That's all I want to say. See you later. <laughs> That's it. Exactly. You said that a few times in the Facebook group too. The WCN crew, like, hey, uh, got another asset manager that's responding. Right. Yeah, now, that, that, that's the point I want to make. You know, what you should do is go back into your uh, ESP mm -hmm. and see how many times you emailed that asset manager before they actually reached out to you. Yeah, that's that's probably pushing 15, 20, maybe 30 times. Okay. Oh, wait a second. Th do you guys hear that? You're thinking the average has been at least over a dozen times? Oh, easily. Yeah. Easily. I think 80% of sales are made after the fifth contact. I think I've heard that somewhere. Yeah. <laughs> now, if you think about it, you're, if you think about how many times you emailed them out there, and if you took a look, at, I don't want you to tell us the number, but if you figure out the amount of profit you've made off the deals, the performing, the other ones that you've got that you've foreclosed on, yeah. you figure out that, what do you think each asset manager email that you've sent out, not you know to 5,000, but what each each email that you've originated, what do you think it's been worth to you if you've? Yeah, I'd have to, I'd have to that's a good question. I have to throw that together and, and see what that spits out. I'd be interested to, to see what that tells me. <laughs> yeah, I guarantee it's gonna have a comma in it at least. I, I would think so, yeah. We've done we've done pretty well with the stuff, and we've been fortunate to, you know, to do the due diligence on the front end that's turned into to a good reperforming loan, um, or do the do the due diligence on a foreclosure that we were able to take back that wasn't too terribly damaged, and um, you know, close on other stuff that you know just made sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you, you do due diligence. You're doing the right thing, and uh, like I said, you've heard it here, guys and gals and listeners out there, Note Nation, some sage advice from. Our buddy uh, Logan at Sage Notes out there, man. So, what's the best way for people to reach out to you, get a hold of you? Uh, you can reach me at my email. It's Logan Hassinger at Sage Notes Inc. Um, you can visit our, our Facebook page, uh, both with uh, Sage Notes and you know my personal profile um, out there with Twitter, uh, LinkedIn. I got a couple of people that always want to reach out and see my professional background as well. And uh, what's the what's the website? Sage Notes dot com. Sage Notes Inc. Dot com. Yep. SageNotesInc.com is a website to catch everything else he's doing out there for you. Well, Logan, man, thanks, man. I've got a lot of great nuggets here for people. Um, and we didn't prepare this at all. We just like yeah. jumped in here and just started talking, right? Yeah, I, I got home from work with, uh, with a tummy ache and, uh, <laughs> and we're having a, having a conversation. Well, it's amazing how much better you feel after you're out of the J-O-B sometimes. Yeah, I think I'm going to have to get in the pool. <laughs> 
It is hot outside. It, it, is, it is too hot. We're pushing 100. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, hey, man, thanks so much for uh, just going out and, and kicking ass, taking names and sharing some great nuggets here on the Note Closure Show today. All right. Absolutely. Thank you, Scott. Welcome, bud. All right, everybody. Hey, that's going to wrap it up for this episode. Like Logan said, the things we talk about, they may seem simple, but if you just keep doing them and doing them and doing it, doing it again and again and again, it's going to uh, feed you again and again and again. Feed you good, everybody. So go out, take some action, buddy, and uh, we'll see you all at the top. Bye.